Call the Broken Arrow City Council meeting to order. Uh, we have invocation by Pastor Rich Maganero. Amen. Well, if we can bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you that you put a, a prayer upon my heart for this council tonight. And you gave me the word agenda. And Lord, I know what that means, Lord, that, Lord, that your agenda would just come over their agenda that your thoughts would encircle their thoughts. I thank you, Lord, that this city, Lord, acknowledges you, even with this prayer first. And Lord, I just pray a blessing, Lord, that your wisdom would prevail, that your life would just flow, and that this city council and the city manager and all that's involved, Lord, all the different ones, the department heads, everybody would move in unity. Oh, Lord, we have one purpose, Lord, and that is to glorify you. May the city of Broken Arrow, Lord, glorify you in unity and strength as you prosper, it, Lord. So I thank you for this counsel. I thank you, Lord, that you can give them wisdom, understanding. You can give them, Father, Lord, courage. And I pray, Father, that your unity would prevail. Lord, protect our first responders. Protect all the department heads, all the city workers. Protect our citizens, Lord. May you cover this city with your love and with your grace. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Did you feel it? I did feel it. <laughs> Always. I did feel it. Thank you. Uh, roll call. Ford. Here. Moody. Here. Parks. Here. Gillespie. Here. Wimpy. Uh, please stand and join the We Below's Pack 900 for the Pledge of Allegiance. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, guys. You did great. Great job, guys. Yeah, good job. <laughs> all right. We have item M to be removed for a brief discussion. And is there any other items to be removed from consent? Move to approve the uh, consent agenda absent item M. Second. M. M. Absent M. item M. Second. Roll call. Mayor, waiting on you. Oh, I said roll call. Oh, we have a motion and a second. Roll call. Quick. Oh, it's me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so item M is the approval of the rezoning for the Dutch Brothers at Core Church. Uh, Vice Mayor Gillespie. I just asked for it to be removed from the consent just because I wanted to say out loud that we have a Dutch Brothers coming to South Broken Arrow. And um, it's going to be in the Aspen Ridge um close to the Aspen Ridge development right there by Core Church. So that was that was really it. So I would like to make that motion um, to approve the rezoning um, for this. And I just happened to grab one before the meeting today. So that <laughs> yes. worked out great. <laughs> yes, she's my Vanna I was tonight. <laughs> yes, the mayor. We're going to have lots of good coffee in South VA. So we have a motion and a second. second. Roll call. I voted, Curtis. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. 
All right, item seven, public hearings, appeals, presentation, recognitions, and awards. Um, item 7A is recognition of a local hero, Mr. Fred G. Holden, a World War II veteran of the U.S. Army Air Force and, um, sorry, Army Air Forces, celebrates his 100th birthday. Councilor Parks. Okay. Uh, I would just like to make a couple of comments, and then I'm going to read our uh, background material, and then the mayor and I will present this to uh, uh, Mr. Holden's son and daughter-in-law, David and Cheryl Holden. Uh, I would like to also compliment the uh, the um, the, the uh, military museum for honoring him. That's where I picked up on it. I've known Mr. Holden and his family for years. I grew up with his kids. Uh, he was a longtime business person here in Broken Arrow, and uh, I was excited to see where he's at and the kind of the hero that you guys presented him for. And I want to make sure that we. Uh, honored him also, uh, General, in this case. Uh, to read a little bit of background material, the recognition of local hero, Mr. Fred G. Holden, a World War II veteran of U.S. Army Air Forces, celebrates his 100th birthday. And that, by the way, is uh, those of us who had family in World War II, uh, this is gets to be a, a really important part as we continue to honor our veterans here in the city. I know my dad, uh, in which uh, David and Cheryl both knew him also, he would have been 100, 100 this year. He died when he was 61. Mm -hmm. So uh, those uh, veterans that are still alive, I feel like still in my heart, represent those that have gone and, and, and passed on. Mr. Fred Holden is a longtime citizen of Broken Era, a War II, War II veteran, and has recently turned 100 years old. Mr. Fred Holden grew up in the tiny town of Blue Jacket in northeastern corner of Oklahoma. Mr. Holden volunteered for the U.S. Army Air Forces one day after his 20th birthday in 1943. Mr. Holden was a flight engineer and a top turret gunner in a four-engine B-24 bomber. His unit was based in Italy. While Mr. Holden was flying toward a target near the Balkans, his plane was hit by friendly fire from another B-24. With two engines out, the bomber ditched in the Adriatic Sea where the crew clung to a floating tire from the main landing gear. A U.S. Navy seaplane spotted the bandage on Mr. Holden's head, where he suffered a cut from a ricocheting bullet that had landed uh, in his uh, area of the airplane. The Holden family moved to uh, Broken Era in 1959, where he expanded his trailer frame business, Holden Trailers, which through his son stayed in business until the mid-1980s. Holden Trailers was located on Highway 51 between Kenosha's 71st Street and Houston, which is 81st Street. Mr. Fred Holden lived alone until just a year ago, but now resides at the Pl Sam Plum Assisted Living in Bigsby. We, the City of Broken Air, salute Mr. Fred G. Holden for his service to our country. And if you guys <laughs> of Fred G. Holden, in honor and recognition of your outstanding service to our country. Before council, we were, Johnny and I were talking about this uh, recognition, and I said, I don't know. I think the water's not so bad. We got a lot of mm -hmm. citizens that are turning a hundred in our city, so something's, something's okay. Must be in the water. It must be in the water. Well, and they were tough. <laughs> they were tough. <laughs> they were tough. <laughs> we don't build them the same way anymore. No. So, <laughs> yeah. so all right, item seven B: presentation and annual programming update by the Military History Center. Michaela Barton and Jim Romancino. 
Speaking of not building them like we used to. Yes. <laughs> Good evening. So I know that General Mancino does not need an introduction, but I just wanted to um, say that last June we added to all of our user agreements that they will come once a year and just kind of give the city an update. Um, there's multiple reasons for that, but I just think it's a it's a good thing that they come. So he's done it multiple times, um, and so I will let him go from here. <laughs> All right, if you bet the over and under on my 50 slides, you better bet the <laughs> under. Because, okay, which one of these goes fast? <laughs> the right one? Uh, I appreciate this opportunity again to come before the city council and, and tell you that uh, – Things are going good down at the Military History Center, and most of it, all of you have already been down there. We just lost our neighbor, Sky Duty, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and great to have Mayor Wimpy on our council, on our board, and uh, Michaela is our city representative. I don't know how you could go wrong by having a city councilman on your board, because if we don't, uh, we really need something, you can go right to them. Okay, first slide. Thank you for that. Military History Center is located at 112. North Main, for those of you that haven't been there, that's the old uh, Franklin Memorial Hospital. And this is our eighth year. The city refurbished that building in 2013, and it's 6,500 square feet, and it's filled to capacity. The founder was Colonel Bob Powell. He was a World War II glider pilot. He brought the museum from Tulsa. Tulsa didn't want the museum. Broken Era did, and I think now we're the number two attraction in Broken Era uh, by one of the services. The museum is organized by uh, different venues of conflicts for the United States. We've got a Revolutionary War Room. We've got an exhibit specifically for our Native American veterans. We've got an extensive Civil War exhibit. The museum has two main long halls that are about at least 100 feet long, and the one on the left is World War I and World War II artifacts. Our founder was a World War II <coughs> glider pilot. So when he came, the majority of the artifacts were World War II artifacts. We've since expanded. Uh, we, we have a, I was fortunate enough to command the 45th Infantry Brigade in Afghanistan. And the guy that got me in uh, this whole deal was Clarence Oliver. And uh, so we dedicated one of the rooms to the 45th Infantry Division, which is Oklahoma's own National Guard and uh, Dr. Oliver was a member of it. We have Korean and Vietnam War artifacts. Uh, all the weapons you see have been demilled or not operational. So if you see a machine gun here and there, don't get too panicked about it. Uh, Desert Storm in Somalia and Afghanistan and Operation Enduring Freedom. And then our staff members, we recently, Jean, Jeannie Bailey recently retired. She was with us from the beginning. And Stacy Jones's husband was a full colonel in the United States Army, and she's a Broken Arrow graduate. And so she's our new executive assistant. And Susan Verdell is our librarian. Our library has over 5,000 books, with the majority of them being historical or historical uh, biographical. We have very few uh, fiction books in there. And the library is accessible to the high school. And, and really, we've kind of expanded it now. At first, we were kind of parochial. Oh, you can't take a book out. But now, if you come in and you see something, you're working on a research pro, pro, uh, project. What am I trying to say? Project. 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 <laughs> you're more than welcome. So uh, we've had a lot of interaction now between the high school and our library. It's, it's hard to, when we first got these service benefit officers or service officers, we really didn't know what was going to happen. Last year, our three service officers saw over 1,400 individual veterans as they helped them with their claims. And this office has become so popular and well-known that we're getting people from all over Oklahoma and out of state coming to work through our veterans uh, benefits officers. So they've been a big, tremendous help because when they leave here, they go down into Broken Air and eat at the tavern and I'm sure have a drink somewhere. <laughs> so we've got Royce Caskey, Lou McGowan, and George Hedrick are our three. They're all certified by the VAs. And that's that's just a little nuance. Instead of going through like the American Legion or something, they can go directly to the VA. And that allows them to access and work their, their claims uh, a lot easier. We actually do flight training at the museum. <laughs> One of our original Earl Laney, who many of you know, was a flight instructor, and he brought in his two flight simulators, and uh, 
we have every day you go in there and you'll see a young man or an older person take flight lessons. Now, it doesn't give them the ability to really fly, but it does help them in getting their FFA cert certification. So we do have flight lessons, especially if you've got young people that are interested in flying. We went up to Evansville, Indiana, and a collector up there said, hey, I want to donate a 1948 military Jeep and a 1954 three-quarter ton truck. So Ken Collins and I made two trips. And they were in some pretty pitiful state of repair, but uh, you can see them now restored. And we pull our, actually, I'm entering that Jeep next year in the cool grills deal because <laughs> I know I'd win because some yeah. commercial Jeep won last year and we could beat that. <laughs> So we also have a, a miniature A-4, which is a, or yeah, A-4, which was a airplane that the Air National Guard flew. And for years, they, the Air National Guard rode it in parades and it fell in disrepair. And they donated to us and one of our friends fixed it up. So we entered in all the parades and we've expanded our parade search. We went up to catch them this year for the Christmas parade and Lieutenant mm -hmm. General Bud Wyatt who was the director of the Air National Guard, actually flew the airplane, and we won first place in the catch and parade. So we've got the trophy at the museum if you want to come down and see it. The brick plaza, this is the exterior of the building. As you can see, we, we actually, as one of our fundraisers, sell bricks in the brick plaza, and we also had one of the cutouts of the, 12, or the 22 statues that are down in Memorial Park and this is of Michael Coons, and it's on exhibit outside the museum. We've been through the BA Memorial story for a long time, but needless to say, through the efforts of Ken Collins and the city council, we moved the old memorial from the city park down to the military history center. And the, the pictures on the right are the BA soldiers that uh, lost their lives in Vietnam. And it's a very nice kind of reflective place to come and visit, especially in the spring. Some of our programs that we present, the Veterans of Vietnam Veterans Recognition Day, March the 17th, or the third Thursday in March. This year, we're going to have the recent Oklahoma Medal of Honor winner, uh, Birdwell, come and speak at that event. So that'll be nice. And the Flag Day ceremony, which we have outside, uh, that was the first event that Colonel Powell had. And, and I'm proud to say that many of you attend that flag ceremony. We also had the salute to veterans at Kirkland Theater where we had the Tulsa Community Band. This was a, wasn't intended as a fundraiser, but it came, became very popular. And this year we had an anonymous donor give us a $5,000 check, which was really nice. So uh, if you like military themed music, uh, the Tulsa Community Band is wonderful. We also have a military trivia fundraiser. I'm proud to say that Councilman Parks was on the winning team one time. <laughs> He was on our team, but not last year. And Mayor Wimpy has never won. But, <laughs> but it's a great event, and we have it down at the Battle Creek, and uh, it's a fun event. Uh, we have a uh, it's just play like regular trivia, only it's military trivia. And if you're interested, let me know because you don't have to be a military expert. Uh, there are plenty of them at the table. You just need to learn how to cheat. Yeah, if, with no cheating. Oh. <laughs> Turn your phones off. I saw your table talking, but that's another story. <laughs> we have also one of our fundraisers at the Military History Center Golf Tournament. We have that at Battle Creek. We have that every year, uh, and that's a great event. And it's, uh, we have about 20, 22 teams. We also have an exhibit for the Oklahoma Air National Guard. When they found out that we had one on the Army Guard, they said, where's your Air Guard exhibit? So... Uh, we built a nice air guard exhibit and just last week one of the planning squadrons for the Oklahoma Air Guard came out and had their meeting in our conference room so the word's getting out and we put it out that you know if you've got an organization you want to have a small meeting uh, feel free to come down and use our conference room at no charge depending unless you got a lot of money this is the maintenance training meeting uh, that they had and uh, it was a good event our biggest fundraiser are now are our, vet, our veteran recognition banners. And people tell you that Broken Air is a military supportive city. They, it really is. I told Johnny Parks I've been driving down some of the small towns on my way to duck hunting early in the morning. And uh, there's nobody's got a main street like Broken Air. And these veteran banners have really enhanced that. Enhanced that. 
we have them on Veterans Day and on uh, Memorial Day. And uh, we may have to talk next year about more polls because we're getting up to maximum on the number of polls that we're filling up. Just a real quick recap, uh, grants. I didn't know I was gonna be a grant writer when I came down and got in on this deal, but we've had some good luck with some grants through the Historical Society. The Kevin Hearn Foundation gave us a nice uh, subsidy and a grant this year. Royce Caskey is one of the benefit counselors and he and his partner formed an LLC because you can't accept money if you're a service officer but they formed an LLC and these people that are getting their benefits, give them money and they turn around and give it to the museum. So it, it's a nice thing. Uh, we just, we just asked for another grant for additional storage cabinets for our storage room, which is filled to capacity. Uh, as you can see, Asbury Church is also a big supporter. We did get some money through the SBA, although we had to pay back $1,000 loan. I'm going to talk to them about that. But, uh, <laughs> as you can see on the services, the veteran service officers are serving over 1,400 veterans a year. And 8,500 donated hours for 2022. We only have one paid employee. Everybody else is a volunteer. And uh, they put in a lot of hours. I don't know how we got that BAPD, community service provider. But I guess we're number one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, again, some of the events, again, we've gone through those, the Trivia Night, the Recognition Day, the Flag Day Ceremony, and other numerous parades. Big question mark for us is what's next? We've got about 200 space that's not filled in the museum of bare walls, and that's adding everything together. Uh, we would have liked to have had your building, <laughs> but uh, in the future, we need to come to the council before the next bond issue because we need to expand. And there's only one way we can go and that's out towards the parking lot because we can't go up, the building won't support it. So with that, I thank you for the opportunity. I'm under five minutes, Michaela, I told you I would be. And if you haven't been down to the museum, I encourage you to come down there and visit, especially if you got young people, I know they'll enjoy it. So thank you very much. Questions? In general, the I couldn't sell it to you, but the current owners can. So. Yes. I, <laughs> I just want you to know that when I came in here, I didn't realize Mike had changed places with somebody more attractive. <laughs> and when the light shines down over there, <laughs> I have to kind of wind up. <laughs> no, I'm not taking my head off. <laughs> but thank you again to the city council for everything you do for the museum. And uh, we really appreciate it. Thank so you, thank sir. you. Thank you. You know, Mayor, if I can just, just say one thing is that obviously we're starting that process later this year to put together the bond package. And I would certainly think that because of what they do and the amount of effort, the volunteer time, the support they get from the community is this is something that we should strongly consider adding to the next bond package. I don't know what that is, but we'll start those conversations with the, with the board about what we could actually do there. All right. Oh, General, you forgot to mention the Ghostbusters tourists. We're the second, we're the third most haunted place. In it's not place. really haunted. So. Mm -hmm. we don't have that time. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go back to a board meeting if it is. <laughs> All right. Um, item eight is citizens' opportunity to address the council. There are none. Um, item nine is general council business. Uh, 9A, consideration, discussion, and possible approval of an authorization to execute resolution number 1511. It is a resolution establishing a temporary 120-day moratorium for applications for special use permits for short-term rentals. Trevor Dennis. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. At the last council meeting, the council directed staff to prepare a moratorium that would uh, basically toll for 120 days the city's uh, receipt of any applications for these short-term rentals. That would give the staff the opportunity to complete its review and make its recommendations that it's currently going on right now. Council can uh, end that early if they wish to, uh, but as it is, it would be for 120 days and then it could be renewed. Have we verified that that's sufficient time for staff to complete the project so that we're not having to revisit this again? It's my understanding that it will be. Is that the case? Yes, we do actually have a draft prepared and we are planning for it to go before planning commission for public hearing next month. And then 
um, tracking for it to come to city council in March. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion then that we approve <coughs> resolution number 1511. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. All right, item 9B, we will table until after beta, I believe, is yes. okay. Item 9C, consideration, discussion, and possible approval of an authorization to execute resolution number 1509, a resolution of necessity to condemn property located at 5111 South 193rd East Avenue. Ethan Edwards. Good evening, Council. Ethan Edwards, uh, Director of Engineering and Construction. Um, the item before you, as you stated, was a resolution of necessity for condemnation. Um, the project is the widening of 23rd or county line from Omaha to Albany. Um, this property that we're, that's in question right now is just south of Omaha on County Line Road. Uh, the property <coughs> is just south of the Miracle Faith Church, if you're familiar with that area on the east side of the road. Um, the negotiation process began in August of 2020, and the first offer was made in... October of 2020. Um, records indicate that the owner requested a total take um, as a counter, but the city only needs a 35 foot strip of right of way for the uh, for this project. So we are able to have a successful negotiation with this property owner. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions? Make a motion to approve resolution uh, 1509. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Okay. Item 9D, consideration, discussion, and possible approval of an authorization to execute resolution number 1510, um, necessity to condemn property located at 5205 South County Line, or 193rd, sorry. Ethan. It has many names. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, pro this, this um, parcel in question here is just south of Omaha on County Line, just north of Core Storage. So it's actually just abuts the property that we that we were just speaking about. Um, this process began also in August of 2020 uh, with the first offer made in February of 2021. Um, at the beginning of this process, a total take was requested. Um, however, an unsuccessful negotiation with virtually no discussion uh, on, on this piece of on this piece of property. So. Um, what the uh, right away agent did note that there was no proximity damages associated with this as well. And I'd be okay. happy to answer any questions you may have. Any discussion? I'll make a motion to approve resolution 1510. Have a motion and a second. Roll call. <coughs> Item 9E Thank consideration, you. discussion, and possible approval of Comp 403 2022. Davis H. Elliott, approximately 37. Point six acres. Jill. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Vice Mayor and City Council, City Manager. The item before you tonight is a request to change the comprehensive plan from level four and level three on a 37.06 acre tract to, um, they're proposing to change it to level six. And the site is undeveloped property. That's um, the southwest corner of Kenosha and Evans Road. And the applicant is proposing to amend the comprehensive plan in order to rezone the property from A1 <laughs> to IL. And the property is intended um, for the future development of Davis H. Elliott, an electrical services company. And with the comprehensive plan, as far as the compatibility side of that, IL is considered permissible in level six under certain conditions. And those conditions are that they're done in association with the PUD, that the site adjoins a existing industrial park or um, the BA Expressway, Muskogee Turnpike or Hi Highway 51 or Creek Turnpike. And such site is reached by arterial streets that do not pass through residential areas. And such, such sites are highly visible from roadway with the appearance of a quality corporate campus or business park and feature quality landscaping, masonry building facades and no outdoor storage of materials and are carefully reviewed as to propose architectural styles, landscaping, location of service areas and according to the PUD procedures. And the last one is that such, such sites that may adjoin residential areas are thoroughly screened and buffered from such area by landscaping and or less intense land uses. The proposed level six area would abut an existing level six development to the west and have access to arterial streets on the north and to the east. 
The south boundary does abut residentially zoned areas and development. However, the requirement to develop the area with a P PUD allows for the opportunity to increase the, and more um, specifically specify the requirements along buffering and landscaping along the south boundary for the protection of the neighboring residents. And the uh, Planning Commission public hearing that was held on December 15th, the Planning Commission recommended approval three to one per staff recommendation. And staff recommended that the comprehensive plan be approved and that platting um, be waived. And two online forms were submitted prior to the meeting and one neighboring resident spoke in opposition to the request and concerns that were uh, a part of that, those online forms and spoke during the meeting were the potential for traffic onto Evans Road, visual screening from the streets and the neighbors in the area and the noise, the potential for noise. Um, and so with that planning commission and staff had recommended <laughs> approval, um, especially with the conditions that the comprehensive plan has for placing extra restrictions for the potential of IL in the future. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know one of the questions I had is um, the only place that um, is like for a growth facility to be in our city is an IL. Correct. And so that was one of the things that I, I had a question about. Mm -hmm. I, I obviously, I can see what's going in here. So obviously it's not going to be a growth facility, but if we change it to IL, they have the ability to do that. Was that something that we, did we get that added? Where, because it was my understanding they would agree to have that inside the PUD that it would not become. And some of the comprehensive plan changes that come before Planning Commission Council have a draft PUD with them. We don't have that with this comprehensive plan change, but that is something that um, if this were to be approved whenever they come before um, Planning Commission and Council with the zoning change, that is an element that can be added to the PUD. Well, that, that was a question is, I'm uncomfortable approving this without the accompanying PUD. I would rather personally wait mm -hmm. to approve this until we have the PUD because that's a requisite for this. Or sure. that this doesn't change unless the PUD is submitted. And yes. approved. Does that make sense? That it's makes, contingent. Yes, that makes sense. And that would be sense. my thought is if we approve this tonight, I would want it to be only approved contingent upon the other completion of the other requirements. Yes, absolutely. That makes sense to me. Okay. But I, it, that doesn't appear to be what is being asked to be approved. So no. that, would, uh, that would be my preference is that any approval is contingent upon submission of the PU approval, submission of an approval of the PUD. Yes, okay. and that could be a condition of the motion. That's correct. All right. Yeah. That being the case, I would make the motion to approve this subject to submission and approval of the PUD. You have a motion? Second it. And a second. Oh, I'm Roll sorry. Call. I didn't click the button. <laughs> it's okay. That's all right. Roll call. <clears throat> Um, item 10A, consideration discussion and possible preview of an ordinance closing a portion of a utility easement from Ferguson Real Estate LLC on property located one half mile south of Albany Street and one eighth mile east of Elm Street. Jill. Thank you. This item is a request to close the utility easement that's on property um, and it, the application was received from Ferguson Real Estate for the Ferguson property for their expansion. And so the water line that was in this e that was in this easement has been relocated and an easement has been dedicated at the new location. And so what's before you tonight is a preview of an ordinance to close that water line. Um, and then at the following agenda, we'd have the actual ordinance and the city <coughs> retains the right to reopen the ordinance. And so the next step would be for the applicant to go to district court to officially vacate that utility easement. This wouldn't affect anything. I know I haven't heard back from that uh, uh, furniture place that was possibly going in. <clears throat> this wouldn't affect anything that they had in their planning. Is that correct? That's correct. It would not affect future plans. Any other discussion? I'll make a motion to preview the ordinance. Let's Second. Remember. Second. Sorry, Johnny. Third. Third. <laughs> Oh, to preview, the, we're previewing the Origin Center for adoption. Okay. All right. Item 11A, consideration, discussion, and possible adoption of ordinance number 3769. 
This item before you is an ordinance to officially change the zoning map for a case that came before you at the last city council meeting. It's BAZ 371-2022, a request to rezone from R3 to DM, located at 815 South Main Street. Uh, city council did approve changing the zoning, and so this actually would codify that, this ordinance, and, and make that change and the, and the change to the zoning map. And we do have a subsequent item to approve the emergency clause. Any Make a motion to approve ordinance number 3769. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call. <clears throat> item uh, 11B is the emergency clause. I can motion to approve the emergency clause in just a minute. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call. Item 11C, consideration, discussion, and possible adoption of ordinance number 3770, an ordinance establishing a fee to defray the cost of collecting delinquent receivables pursuant to um, 11 OS 22-138. Curtis Green. Thank you, Mayor, <coughs> Vice Mayor, Councilor, <coughs> Mr. Spurgeon. Uh, the item before you this evening is to uh, create an ordinance establishing a fee to defray the cost of collecting delinquent receivables pursuant to state law. Earlier this evening on the consent agenda, you approved and authorized the execution of an agreement with Purdue, uh, Brandon, Fielder, Collins, and Mott, a law firm that specializes in um, collecting government receivables. So what this, <clears throat> excuse me, what this ordinance will do is in line with state law, it allows the city to impose an additional fee of up to 35% on all debts and accounts receivable that have been referred to a private firm for collections. So essentially what this is, it's just another layer of due process. It's also um, uh, creates another layer of transparency. If you as a citizen owe the city money, uh, you know, there's going to be a fee attached to it to defray those costs for the firm to collect those fees. And so we would ask that you would adopt the ordinance 3770 and approve the emergency clause. Um, I'll make a, is there any, okay. I'll make a motion to uh, pass ordinance number 3770. Second. I have a motion and a second. I'll call. <coughs> Item 11D is the emergency clause. Move for the emergency clause. Maybe. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Uh, remarks and inquiries by governing body members. Well, I'll just say I attended the fire oh, and with a couple of other <laughs> counselors here. Um, the fire department's awards banquet. And they always do such a great job that I love that they... Um, recognize the communication officers and that they also recognize the survivors. Um, our, our firefighters do an amazing job and they were recognized as well, but I, I just loved everything about it. it. It was a really good time and they did a great job. And then the survivors are, they, they attend as well. That was always mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, I spent the weekend in Chicago because our daughter's a uh, boyfriend just graduated from Navy boot camp, so that was pretty exciting that, to see almost 600 cadets graduate just that weekend. And they 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 have boot camp 48 weekends out of the year, or graduation, you know, um, 48 weekends out of the year. So I'm like, they're still signing up for us. Hmm. So, and Great anyway, pictures. I will share, I attended the Chili Bowl, and um, I, of course, y'all know I'm a huge race fan, but Broken Arrow is well represented at the Chili Bowl. I mean, not just the those that I talk about, Tanner Thorson and Brady Bacon, who, you know, or Tanner Thorson actually got second this year in the, um, he's not a Broken Air native, but he lives in Broken Air now. And, um, and so, but just overall, there are dozens of Broken Arrow, um, you know, people that claim Broken Arrow is their home that compete in this. Um, it's so fun, but Tulsa County just does a great job in putting, it's, it's a massive event. And I, just a fun fact, they, if y'all have ever been out there, they take in 700 um, dump truck loads of dirt into um, the chili bowl and then remove them. And they actually store the dirt. They don't, 
So every year they reuse the same dirt. And so that was, I, I learned that this year and I was like, that's a lot of dump truck loads. And they start like immediately, like as they're saying their congratulations, they're out there like tearing everything down to get it all done by the next day. So I was surprised it's you done. didn't wear a chili bowl shirt tonight. Yes. Cause I think last year you yes. wore a chili bowl yes. shirt. I am. I w I'm sick of, I went to the chili bowl every single night last week. So I was <laughs> sick of chili bowl t-shirts. So. I did it for my first time. Yes. I only went once. Though, yes. So she, I don't think I would have made it all year. It's a little loud. In it's very loud. Lots of fumes. It is. Yep. All right. Second manager. Thank you, Mayor. Member, members of Council, good evening. Um, I'd like to thank Council Member Ford for mentioning the banquet last Saturday night. And I just want to take a moment and reflect that the first, our police department does the exact same thing mm -hmm. when they have their annual banquet where the the administration and the awards committee uh, recognize the officers that that performed many different life-saving measures and protecting our citizens in public. And it obviously we're not going to televise those things, but I can tell you it's it's very humbling and amazing to hear the efforts that uh, take place on behalf of our police officers and our firefighter par paramedics to save people's lives. And it was a little personal for me this year because one of the individuals they saved was one of my very best friends out at Challenger softball complex. And they recognized the three civilians that actually um, sustained him until our paramedics could arrive. And so it was very surreal to see uh, that uh, individual be recognized and to see so many of those folks that had something to do with it. And so I public wanted to acknowledge and I know everyone, everybody's been there and you try to get there with their busy schedules, but it was, it was pretty humbling to see that and a personal connection this year. Uh, so I just appreciate both chiefs and all their administrations for what they do. Secondly, is that just real quick today, the Chamber of Commerce had their Rooster Days uh, press conference, the 92nd annual press, press uh, annual event we're going to be holding. Uh, Scott Udy in his capacity as a civilian is the chair of uh, of that committee again this year. And it is going to be on the 18th or the 21st. It's back in May. And that was, that was emphasized a great deal today. The lineup is amazing. And I just want to just express my gratitude on behalf of the council to the chamber for continuing to do this. I see Jennifer Conway's in the back and I know that uh, her team works very hard on this. And so it's, it is, a, it is an amazing event for our community. And I know everyone's happy for it to be back in, in, um, in May. And then the last thing I want to mention is the council members have before you a copy of this year's annual newsletter, which is the Thrive, which has been known and continues to be known as uh, Your Money at Work newsletter. And we went digital this year uh, because of the cost is one reason, but also to try to reach more, more folks. And I would encourage everyone to take a look at this because it is full of information about what I would call money in, money out, where the money comes in from, where it goes to how we compare with utility rates, sales tax rates, uh, property taxes, uh, and so forth. And then, then we always finish up with uh, the projects because that's what affects our, our residents the most. And it's our, it's our most important asset. And if you turn to page 30 and 31, and I'm saying this for the public because I know a lot of people watch our meetings, and it just shows the, the, the total amount of the bond package we just sold. And I wanted to mention a couple of the projects I mentioned at the State of the City, but I think it's important to mention is that the widening of Houston from Garnet to Olive is a part of, of this fiscal year and next fiscal year. The widening of Houston from Olive to Aspen. The widening from Washington from Olive to Aspen. The widening of a Washington from 9th to 23rd Street. Also widening of 9th from Houston to, Houston to Washington. And jumping down here, it's so another one, uh, also widening of 9th from Washington, New Orleans in the design phase. And then there's also the widening of 23rd Street from Omaha to Albany. That's construction. That's county line. This is um, it's going to be amazing, actually, to, re to widen that road over on the east side of our community by the high school and to replace that bridge. And then also something very, very important I know that we hear a lot about is the widening of the 37th Street from Dearborn to Omaha. It's in front of Liberty School. And that is for the right of way and utilities. And so following those comes construction. So it's very exciting that we're there. And we've also, the council approved over $2 million to implement our residential street improvement program to keep our PCI 
at approximately 70 or higher. And as you know, we're out to bid right now and under contract to actually update our, our, our pavement condition index. And there's also a number of other projects, uh, quality of life on, on page 31. And so I'm just really excited about the work that Ethan and his team did to get these from basically from design to right of way to construction, which is a multi-year process. So hopefully folks will take a chance, take the time, I should say, to review this. And the last thing I want to mention is uh, Kenny gave me notice that Thursday of this week, the Oklahoma Department of Transportation is going to um, open bids for the county line road project from Kenosha to Houston, which includes the replacement of the bridge. Mm. And so he doesn't, based on his information, he doesn't see any any concerns from, from the Department of Transportation's uh, point of view. So they'll open those bids and eventually the board will approve them. And it takes a little bit longer than it does us. We're usually about 60 days from the time from award until we actually start seeing turn and dirt. It could be probably late spring, but I can, but I can tell you how excited we are. This is a 13, 14 million dollar project that is years in, in the making, and it's going to be something that's very much needed. So I'll let council know once we find out from, from ODOT exactly what's what's happening with that project. If a citizen were to want this in a hard copy, do they just come up to City Hall or can they request it one to be mailed to them? We did print some copies. We have some in there. So someone who wants a copy, they can they can contact any member of council or they can contact my office. Uh, we did pr print a limited number of them. If the demand is high for that, then we can certainly print some more. We'll keep those prints small. We've always given a copy of those to our federal delegation, and we usually get, make those available to the council members uh, when you all go to Washington to give, because I've gotten lots of feedback from elected officials over the year. They will take a time, or there, maybe their staff members will point things out to them, and they'll mention them whenever they're in conversation with us. But Aaron and his team get all the, the kudos for putting together all this great information that just continues the tradition of providing great transparency on how we how we receive our dollars and what we do with them. Mayor, I do have one more thing, if you don't mind. Um, I just realized that we won't have another meeting, um, but Margaret Hayes with the fire department, almost 50 years, I think maybe 48 to be official, um, is retiring. And I, she's ha she's, they're having a celebration for her, but there's going to be some big shoes to fill. She's just the sweetest. She's gone through, you know, several chiefs and interim chiefs. And she was recognized also at the banquet that night. And She's just a sweetie. So I, I want to congratulate her on her retirement. Very well deserved. And I'm sure there's a lot of cruising in her future. Yes. So. <laughs> and very big shoes to fill. You're not yes. you are correct there. All right. Let's see. We do have an executive session, so. Make a motion to take a brief recess uh, to enter Bama and Beta. Second. With a motion and second. Roll call. <clears throat> Ford. Yes. Nudie. Yes. Parks. Yes. Gillespie. Yes. Wimpy. Yes. Call to Broken Arrow Municipal Authority meeting to order. Roll call. Ford. Here. Nudie. Here. Parks. Here. Gillespie. Here. Wimpy. Here. Are there any items to be removed from the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. The motion and a second. Roll call. <clears throat> <laughs> you have to vote. Anything? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, item 5A, public hearings, appeals, presentations, um, notification of the Burger Grease River Water Treatment Plant participation in the public service company Peak Performers Program. Charles. Oh, I don't think I should have double espresso coffees. <laughs> Before, yeah, no, I'm all over this. So. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, City Councilors, uh, Mr. Spurgeon, uh, Chuck Vokes, Utilities Director. Uh, I'm pleased to be here to share some information about the PSO Peak Performers Program. Uh, the Vertigus Water Treatment Plan has been participating in this program for about eight years. Uh, the program, what it's for is it rewards businesses for reducing their electric use during high demand periods. And um, the water plant was designed, of course, with emergency generators built in. And as a result of that, that allows us to participate in the program. So what PSO does is, is they notify us if it's going to be a hot uh, day and there's going to be a lot of electric use. They'll notify us and then we'll switch over to our generators for that afternoon. 
Uh, it really has no impact other than just kind of exercising the generators. Um, the 2022 incentive was about $68,000 in total. And um, over the years, we've received almost $330,000. So um, I'd like to share in 2022, our electric bill was about $600,000. Uh, for that year. And so that's about 11% we're getting back from PSO. Um, so it, it's a great program. And uh, um, I think someone questioned whether we could extend the program to uh, our other facilities. And I think we need to look at that. Back in 2015, when we joined the program, um, I think they were a little bit more limited in who they would accept into the program. But it's my understanding that they are allowing other businesses in. So um, I think we're going to look at that. So I, I did ask that question because when I was on the union school board, mm -hmm. we were also part of that program and yes. we saved a lot of money. Right. So uh, yeah, right. that, so that you have to have your own, um, be able to track it at your own building. So has that been the problem, I guess, before is that we don't have a, uh, you have to have the equipment too. to so be able to back it up. Like the okay. emergency generator that we just put in here, uh, that has to be able to transfer power and it has to do it seamlessly so that y'all aren't sitting in the dark for a few minutes or, <laughs> you know, whatever you're working on, on yeah. your computer goes blank. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it does take some, um, some infrastructure to be able to participate in, in that program, but it's certainly something we can look at because it is a big savings. Yeah. So um, the only cost of the city would, were we to expand and the only cost of the water, treatment facility is the use of the diesel or whatever right power right the yeah it's really just exercising our generators uh, so uh, and, which is existing with the facility so it probably didn't hurt to fire them up every once in a while anyway. <laughs> yes that's right that's right so you know it's probably good to them to whoever wants to haul them how are they do they use diesel or do they use natural gas they, they're diesel yeah and and they do they're on a schedule they run every every week for a couple of hours just to keep, make sure that they're they're good to go but uh, uh you know uh, i think it's a great program we happen to have our pso representative in the audience today so maybe he's hearing this discussion. yeah yes. that's good <laughs> that's good so <clears throat> any other questions uh, so. no sir thank you thank you we have no general authority business uh remarks from governing body members city manager Yes, Madam Chair, I have a couple of things I wanted to mention regarding utilities. Uh, first off, at the Rose District Merchants meeting a week ago, Monday, there was a, a little bit of discussion after the meeting about the need to improve the lighting in the alleyways, especially the fact that the city is going to be going in and resurfacing the west alleyways, and we have a lot more uh, customers and employees that are using the alleyways to get the various parking uh, lots that we have. So I did speak to, to Michael Gordon and, and the engineers, the PSO are going to be working with our TED team to take a look at that, what could be done to those. And so if you get a question from anyone about the need for additional safety and security type lighting, there will be some lighting obviously that I would like to, to incorporate into the city's uh, account to help with safety and security, then there may be other other lighting needs outside that each individual business may may want to consider as a part of their operation. But if anybody asks you, that's something we're going to do this year. That was a su suggestion made by a couple of the the business the business owners operators in the Rose District. So in case you hear that, and secondly is that um, this week PSO kicks off their public education campaign with regard to the franchise renewal. And I wanted to let the council members know, and I'm going to have Aaron send you some more information by way of email, uh, but they're asking everyone to go to www.poweringba.com. They're going to be have a lot of uh, facts and figures and information uh, regarding the initiative. And then they're going to be doing uh, various social media posts and education with regard to the vote on February 14th. We're in the process. Uh, Aaron's team is, to look at doing some some public education as well as well as several videos. And so we've been we've been coordinating with uh, their communications team in regards to promoting the upcoming vote, which is really just a little less than a month away. And then finally, with don't regard, to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but don't forget to say it's before you go. You go on your Valentine's Day. Go make sure you go. Yes, that's exactly right. So take your Valentine's today. So make sure you go vote and then take them out to one of the local BA re uh, restaurants. <laughs> Many of the great restaurants we have. Um, 
And then last, in the Thrive Edition on page 16 starts a lot of information about utilities. And it starts with the water quality. And I can tell you that Chuck Folks has done an amazing job since he got here in terms of improving the water quality in, in our system. And then it goes into utility rate comparisons, which I think is always important to uh, show exactly where we stand with regard to what the costs are for utilities. And then it goes into something near and dear to one person's hearts, that's solid waste recycling in the picture of five new uh, side loading trucks for um, Director Schuber, which is actually pretty cool looking. Um, it's a great investment on behalf of the city. And that's, that's really utilities. And I think that's important that we point that out. You know, we are going to be looking at ways. I mean, obviously, you know, we've done videos in the past and I've actually used my utility bill where in the winter months, how much, how much like uh, water or utilities uh, I use versus the summer. And I have a sprinkler system, but yet we continue to have folks that there's a disconnect between understanding the increase in the cost of their, of their bills in the summer when they have sprinklers and pools versus the winter months. You know, we, at some point very in the near future, we will have the ability to actually customers will be able to get online and see their and to see how much water that they're actually using at that particular time. Well, our staff has that ability now. So when people call in, we can actually show them that their sprinkler was on at 347 AM and ran for two hours. You know, so we've got that technology and that was something council approved in the capital budget to be able to provide more transparency about how much water is being used. And so I just want to point out there's good information about utilities in here and that while we understand that customers have concerns. We're still trying to make sure we put out good information about exactly uh, how rate, how what affects the rates and things that they can do. The water challenge, for example, that we do every year, as well as making sure they understand there is going to be an increase. So we, I want to take a more proactive approach this year by actually start putting stuff out uh, long before the hot summer months to talk about what can, what they can anticipate in terms of if you have a sprinkler system and a water system. I know that's not going to help completely, but I think it's important to make sure that we're providing that information. So on, on that note, um, I I saw a post on one of the uh, Facebook or one of those sites, um, and uh, uh, started out with very great frustration over the water bill, and then ended with thanking the city and specifically, and I want to point this out, Cynthia Arnold, for taking the time to go through what you just explained and explaining how the water had been used, how the bill was. And, and by the end of the post, which started out rather frustrated with the city and the water bill and all that, and I understand because it's expensive. At the end of it, thinking, because Cindy spent the time doing that and worked with that homeowner or that, that customer to reach a payment plan that was they could afford, and the city will do that. Um, it was so nice to see it by the end of it, they were thanking the city and saying, you don't always know why your water's high, but there is a reason and call the city because they will work with you. And, and Cindy Arnold was, this, was really, really sweet. So I, one, I wanted to point out that our, that department is doing a good job in helping people who reach out to them, specifically, uh, the director, Cynthia Arnold. And two, I wanted to, uh, let people know that, you know, we have to pay for the water. We have to provide this. But at the same time, we understand there are times when bad things happen and, and we want to work with people. We don't, we're not here with a cudgel. We want to provide the services you need uh, at a reasonable rate and we'll work with you when it's unreasonable. And to, and to contact the city. Yes, we please. We're not always on Facebook just waiting for someone to post something that's and going wrong. You know how rare I am. So I actually <laughs> saw this and yeah, I thought, well, <laughs> Well, there has been an effort over the last several years for all the directors, and I appreciate Kenny and, and Norm's help in, in doing um, what I call passively listening, where the directors and, and the senior staff members are actually looking at all the different social media sites, but they don't. we have only a couple of people that even look at them consistently. So the, the mayor is correct to, to the public. If you have a concern, you need to call us because it might be days before someone noticed that post. post. Kurt Poole in Utility Billings does an amazing job, and he's probably had something to do with pointing that out to Mrs. Arnold, and then she jumped on it from there. And so we're, we're still somewhat, um, I would say, reactive. We try to be proactively reactive in terms of we see it, and then we try to address it. But if, if I think folks, if they would just call, we'd have the opportunity to talk to them, look at their account, and if, in fact, we've done something that's that's uh, incorrect in terms of uh, billing them, we, we will we will make the appropriate credits. Sure. There's not going to be any arguing. We're going to work things out. Mm -hmm. If there's an issue to need to create a payment plan, we will do that. Uh, it, sometimes um, we're just behind because of not having someone, as the mayor said, 
monitoring that. But when we do see it, uh, Cricket Moore is amazing at finding uh, areas where we need to go look at something and then we go to address it. And so not everyone takes the time to, to do that. And we understand that may not have the time, but we will we will address them when we see them. But if they will call us, we can get it done quicker. Well, and even, I mean, I know uh, Lisa and our Councillor Ford and Vice Mayor and myself are, are on Facebook quite a bit, but we, but a lot of times it's us sharing information, not scrolling for information. Or So, it, I mean, even though we're very active on social media, we're not always seeing things either. So it's always a good thing to contact the city <coughs> first. Well, it is. I'll pass that along, Council Member. I appreciate that. I know she's probably watching, and I thank you for the kind words. All right. Uh, there, are, there is no executive session. Need to adjourn. Second. Have a motion and a second. Roll call. <laughs> call the Broken Air Economic Development Authority to order. Roll call. Ford here. Moody here. Parks here. Gillespie here. Wimpy here. Are there any items to be removed from the consent agenda? I'm going to approve the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. <laughs> Roll call. Oh, How many times am I supposed to click? <laughs> I'm coming up. You're Third faster than I am. Oh, oh, one, one more time there, <laughs> Mr. Reed. There you go. All right. Um, there are no presentations. General authority business 6A consideration, discussion, and possible approval of an authorization to execute an agreement for professional consultant services with BKL for innovation district infrastructure improvements. Ooh, Ethan Edwards. Good evening, yeah. Madam Chair, uh, trustees, Mr. Spurgeon. Uh, I am happy to, to bring this uh, item before you the contract for the design of our. Uh, our primary infrastructure for the innovation district. This is super exciting for everybody. Um, I know we've all been looking forward to this. Uh, we do have a, an, a, an exhibit up here that's going to show basically what the, what the crux of the design is for. Uh, we're going to be looking at design of a four lane road section um, from Florence South through the, through the innovation district. It's going to be our, our main arterial uh, roadway for the, for the project. And then we'll have a, um, interconnect going west to the to the floodplain which will be in a future phase to go across that um, and then we have water lines sanitary sewer lift station uh, stormwater drainage all the basic and, and core infrastructure um, that's going to be necessary for the innovation district so i don't know if you mr spurgeon uh, mr schwab anything to say kenny go ahead I'll, I'll make some comments when you finish up we will also be uh, taking a look at some of the hydrology and hydraulics here for stormwater. And uh, Ethan may have touched on that, but if there's any detention requirements, uh, we're going to try to offset some of that in the park, Elam Park across the street and to the east a little bit. Uh, if we can get more of the detention there, make more of a water feature, i.e. in the park, and then just leave this for water features, we're going to try to balance that if we can. The only thing I would add is it's important that we as a city move forward getting started because obviously it takes time to design plans. And I, I knew Kenny was going to mention the hydrology because he's talked about that. That's going to kind of set the stage for a lot of what we do. So we need to have that done first. And that's that's going to take a little bit of time. And should there be a, a, a change in terms of what the EDC recommends, <laughs> then we'd be able to adjust accordingly based on their someone that wanted to to actually move into the innovation district and, and then we could adjust the, the location of the road and the other improvements on that. But the hydrology is one of the most important things we do. And so I've, I've asked them uh, to complete this. When I go before the chamber next year, there are certain goals that I'd like for us to be able to hit and relates to getting the infrastructure in place to remove that obstacle. Because obviously when the EDC is out recruiting businesses, they're going to be wanting to go to places that have the ability to, for them to actually connect to utilities and get started. And if we don't have that, I think that's a detriment <coughs> to us to being able to get uh, business and industry to locate there. So we're still going to be flexible in what this could look like, but we need to get the process started. So we're looking at having a bid package ready uh, before the end of this calendar year. So that's the goal. So a question that I had, this is, I know this is just for the, cons we're approving a consultant. Um, Will will the design come back before us then? Yes. Once? Okay. Yes, ma'am. 
because yes, I mean, I, my vision, my thought is that I mean, this needs to be like awesome because <laughs> that's what you know. That's the type of businesses that we're wanting to to come to this area. So. Yeah, once we have this, I mean, this will go through the process. The EDC is going to be the tip of the spear. And so once we have this contract and as we start to lay everything out, I mean, they'll they'll actually be bringing forth recommendations with the TED team and myself in terms of how we'd like to see. And I, I know what you're speaking about, Vice Mayor, in mm -hmm. terms of the amenities that go along with the concrete and asphalt. Right. And so we're going to make sure that we we do this exactly the way that I, I, I've spoken to all of you about, you know, having the vision about what would these want to be based on either what we've seen in – in print or what we've seen in person. Okay, the question I have would be, uh, I know the roadway, I believe, going to the west, that's not part of the innovation district. That's just kind of a tentative plan setting up there, correct? That is correct. Correct. Okay, uh, because that goes across the uh, creek, and that, that's not part of that innovation district. But to the south, I thought that was eventually going to come back and tie back in uh, to the next street back there. So the way that shows, that's really going to stop for now. It's not going to go ahead and continue on down? For the design, we will take it all the way down to the southern border. And if there's enough money in construction, we'll take it to the southern border that you're seeing. Then as it moves towards the east along the turnpike and then ties back into our development on the east, we don't own any of that property at this point in time. So there will be another phase. Uh, right now, if we constructed everything that you see um, all the way down to the south, we'd have a big like turnaround at this point. Right. And, but I just want to make sure that yes. that is part of the innovation district. So eventually that will either turn around big or continue on out. Correct. It's not like that to the west, which is actually not even our Correct. Point. Correct. Because the long term, though, long term was to have a service road that ran along the turnpike yes, to, yes. uh, to the property on the, to, right. to Aspen, basically. That's correct. Well, and and then just, eventually have it cross that bridge. I mean, that's part of the long-term plan, right? Yes. I was just confused <clears throat> why, why it wasn't going ahead and at least planned to the edge of our property. But it's conceptually, we're still looking at it, but, but that's not part of their planning on this. We will take it to the edge of our property. I think they just broke it up in the map this way, but we're, we're going to extend it to the edge of our property. <laughs> Let me just add something, Council Member. Uh, two things correct is the plan is at some point, whether with these funds or presented to the council in the next bond package, could be to eventually tie Aspen into the innovation district. And secondly, if you remember, one of the conditions of purchasing the land is we had to agree yes. to the property owner we bought the land from is to um, can put funding in the in the next bond package to actually put a bridge across that that uh, waterway that would tie into their property, which which is commercial and retail. And so we that's why we've stubbed that off there, knowing that in 2027, we'll ask voters as a part of our agreement to purchase the land to consider. And they understand that if the voters don't approve it, then it's it's not going to happen. But that was a condition that they had to selling the land. And I think by that time, will there be, there'll be much movement that it'll be well justified. Okay. I thought that's the way I understood it. I was just a little bit confused about the law in the South there. And if I could add, this contract, as Ethan said, is for the engineering and the design to get to those construction plans for all the infrastructure. There will be another contract with a surveying company probably in 30 days that uh, will bring back uh, to the governing bodies for the platting process. As Mr. Spurgeon said, we want to get to a point that we can sell land pretty quick, too. I have to have it in the platting so some of the discussions that you talked about, the amenities, your say, we will actually take this project just like a development through planning commission and into the council. So yes, you'll have a say in it. Yep. I, I actually just went into the documents that I was, I was like, I know something is missing up there and it is, it's here, but it's not up there, but there is on here. It says there will be a possible roundabout <laughs> <laughs> and the, um, it literally is right here, but it's not up there. Intersection design. Yes. I, I think it's called roundabout park. I, that's what I just. <laughs> love it. Love it. <laughs> Sorry. Conceptually. I'm sure we can. Conceptual. <laughs> everything. I'd make a motion to approve and authorize the execution of the agreement for professional <laughs> consultant services with PKL Inc. I second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call. 
There is no executive session. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Entertain a motion. Make a motion to oh, adjourn. No remark. No, oh, is that the remarks? Okay, oh, that she, was... she skipped the remarks. Oh, I'm so sorry. Did you have any? No, no. no. <laughs> I did want to say, so. I, I forgot. Um, Councillor Udi and Councillor Parks announced a long time ago, but I wanted, I did want to say that I put it out there on social media this week that I am. Y'all are so lucky, possibly, that I am going to run for re-election for city council. So I just um, wanted to let, kind of put it on publicly, publicly out there. So let the fun begin. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I still make a motion to adjourn. Okay. <laughs> yes. I'll second it. And we have a motion to second. Roll call. All right, we do have executive session. We also have to approve that item. B. Oh, that is right. I, and I just happened to see it. That's how I knew. So. Uh, I'm glad you did. Okay, so call uh, the city council meeting back in session. Roll call. Right? No, uh, no we do not have to do that. We just need to take up we just need to, Oh, so sorry. Yes, yeah, so item 9B. Yes, mm -hmm. 9B, consideration, discussion, and possible approval of an authorization to execute an agreement for professional consulting services. Ethan Edwards step down. But... That, that, this just ratifies it's a, what we Yes, did. it's the same item that we just presented. Okay. And I make the same motion yep. in council. Okay. Second. Promotion and a second. Roll call. All right. Now we have a now, executive session. Now, Mayor, I'll make a motion for a brief <laughs> recess to clear the room for executive session. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Ford. Yes. Hootie. Yes. Parks. Yes. Gillespie. Yes. Wimpy. Yes. Seven forty. Everyone should be excited. Good job. As long as. I mean, surely someone would have caught that. Well, yes. I, I made a note. Call us at home. Yeah. Curtis would have called it. I'm sure.